Hey, aloha no kako. This is Kenton Kuba again coming to you from the island of Maui in the Pacific. Well, we're going to finish our series on Genesis chapter 6. And uh, before we get to that passage, again, I want to invite you to my discipleship website, BibleStudyCD.com. You can see that right up here. And if you come here, you can download free discipleship materials, Bible study materials for your personal use or your personal ministry or to send to people across the city across your town, across your state, and to the other parts of the world, even through uh, the internet on your email. So anyway, let's get to the uh, passage. <clears throat> Genesis chapter 6. For a study of this passage, again, go to parts 1 and 2, where we covered uh, the introduction here, covered the uh, using of the book of Enoch, as well as this, this the verses. Again, uh, one thing we did discover again here, is that God looked upon the wickedness of man. It was so great that he finally said, man, I wish I had never made man, you know. That's kind of like what uh, what he thought here. It grieved him in his heart because of the effect of sin. And for a uh, study of that, and it was grave sin, uh, we took a look at the book of Enoch, chapter 6, 1 to 8, 2. Uh, go to part 2 for this study right here. It's a... Uh, really worth looking at and learning what Enoch had to say too. And so we finished that and now we are in the application phase. And to to do the application I'd like us to first of all look at number one the watchers. The watchers again were the sons of God, the angels and some some would say even like these divine beings that were higher than the angels. But I, I would say I would call them angels because you see them uh, called angels in terms of uh, Job and, and the way the the term sons of God is, is used. And also Peter and Jude called them angels. So if uh, Peter and Jude calls them angels uh, versus, you know, uh, sons of Seth or other humans, uh, they called them angels. And so who am I to disagree? And who is anyone to disagree with Peter and Jude? Because they are speaking and writing under inspiration of the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit has inspired them to write about this passage right here. And the Holy Spirit calls the watchers angels. The angels had sinned against God by cohabiting with women uh, and uh, procreating with them to create their uh, children, which were, the, which were the Nephilim or the giants. And because of that great sin and the wickedness that it created among even the human population, um, God decided to destroy all humans, all flesh, and preserve only one family. That was Noah and his family. And again, go back to part number two to read that. So the watchers are these angels. Uh, we're going to look into the book of Jubilees now. Uh, we covered the book of Enoch, and I told you that the book of Enoch was preserved for centuries, 1,200 years. It had disappeared from the... Uh, the use in um, the churches, but it, it had been preserved by the Falasha Jews in Ethiopia because they included it in their canon of the Old Testament and uh, so they preserved copies of it and when this explorer James Bruce had gone there he brought back uh, three copies of the Book of Enoch but he also brought back four copies of the Book of Jubilees and they translated those and in fact, the Book of Jubilees was also found in the Dead Sea Scrolls Library. They found 15 copies of the Book of Jubilees in the Dead Sea Scroll Caves. And uh, using that, they authenticated the copies that the Ethiopian Jews had, and which showed that their copies were accurate as well. And so we're going to look at Jubilees. It's not in the canon. It's not considered inspired of God, but it is a book that is written in the period before Christ, and it gives us insight in how people viewed and how they interpreted uh, what the Bible was saying. And it gives us more about these watchers, as we're going to see. And then we're going to look at the scriptures, Deuteronomy, as well as Daniel, to show um, what the watchers, what their responsibilities were, because I'm going to apply it to us as well. So let's go to the book of Jubilee, the book of Jubilees here. <clears throat> Chapter 4, 15b to 16a, just that little portion. It says, Mahalalel took upon him, 
took upon unto him to wife Dinah, the daughter of Barakio, the daughter of his father's brother. And she bare him a son in the third week in the sixth year, and he called his name Jared. For in his days the angels of the Lord descended on the earth. This part, this portion right here, is uh, included in the book of Genesis, in, in chapter 5, I believe. Except it probably doesn't mention that he took his wife Dinah and that she was the daughter of Barakio. This part right here is given by Jubilee, the author of Jubilee. Now, how, how did he know that? Know that it was probably passed down through um, eons, through uh, just a verbal history. Uh, and here in Hawaii, the Hawaiians didn't have a, a written language until the missionaries came and then they turned it into a written language. But before the missionaries came, how did the Hawaiians know their history? Well, they created these chants that they could verbally uh, sing out or chant out. And along with the chants, they would create the hula, which was the dance expression of the chants. And so using this method of uh, verbal um, um, passing down these chants to the next generation, they could keep track of their history. And I'm sure... Uh, for the Israelites, it was in a similar way. <clears throat> but they also had writing because uh, Moses wrote in Hebrew, and this is, you know, before 1000 BC. He was writing about 1400 BC, and there was, they have discovered that there was writing centuries even before him. So the, these stories, including the names of Dinah and Barakio, were probably written down as well. And so the writer of Jubilees, which they believe was written in about the 2nd uh, century B.C., probably had, a, had seen these manuscripts, and so he wrote these things down. But it says that uh, Mahalalel called his son's name Jared, for in his days the angels of the Lord descended on the earth. And this word Jared in Hebrew means descent. And so you can see at this time is when the... Uh, sons of God came upon the earth and then Enoch which is Jared's son by his time the uh, offspring of these sons of God and the daughters of men had, had proliferated such that many of the people now had these this gene genetic uh, <clears throat> hybridization or mutation you could say they had included the genes of these sons of God and that was one of the reasons we're going to see that God uh, destroyed the earth or destroyed all flesh on the earth it says, For in his days the angel of the Lord, the Lord descended on the earth, those who are named the watchers. And so see right, even right here, the angels of the Lord are called the watchers. So even uh, the book of Jubilees says they're angels. Now listen to this part. That they should instruct the children of men, and that they should do judgment and uprightness on the earth. What was what were what was the um, purpose of the watchers right here? They were to instruct the children of men, and that they should do judgment. In other words, settle disputes and stand in judgment over maybe two contending parties, and uprightness to stand for God's righteousness and what God how God wanted the men to live. That these watchers were supposed to stand for this uprightness on earth. <clears throat> Of course, we, we have read in the book of Enoch that they failed miserably because they were enticed and seduced and tempted by the beauty of the daughters of men. And so they were tempted to be like, like men in terms of having children of their own and of uh, having a wife. And so that kind of destroyed the whole thing. You know, They did instruct the children of men, but they began to instruct them, as we learned, in the art of war, in the making of armor, and swords and spears, etc., in the cosmetics for the women and the beautification of the external uh, beautification of the women. And that, that, as the book of Enoch says, and the world was never the same after that. And, uh, and we, we're even living in the change. You know, I mean, we live in a period where cosmetics is a billion dollar industry, and uh, it, it has been the same. And of course, as the, the saying goes, sex sells and so you know we all know that the allure of a beautiful woman is something that attracts both men and women to a product and to herself as well and so this whole thing went went awry 
that the instruction of the children of men, that they would stand in judgment of, of the children of men uh, so that they could judge according to the uh, judgments of God. That all went out the window at this point, and God felt that he needed to just make a drastic correction, which was the flood. Well, is there any um, um, instances in the scripture that will support this? <clears throat> and here, here's, here we see in Deuteronomy 32 verse 8, I'm going to show you three different versions of this verse. I want to show you something about it. First from the King James Version. It says, When the Most High divided to the nations their inheritance, when He separated the sons of Adam. And here we're talking about a time uh, at the Tower of Babel when He confused man with different languages and they began to move in different directions on the face of the earth and they formed different nations. This is the time that this, this is talking about when He divided man, mankind into different nations. It says, He set the bounds of the people according to the number of the children of Israel. This is how the King James interprets this, um, um, the uh, Hebrew text. And, um, and uh, it's very interesting because most of the versions today have this, this thing, the children of Israel. But what's interesting is that when the nations were formed and mankind was divided, Israel wasn't formed yet because Abraham hadn't been born at that time. And definitely uh, Jacob and his 12 sons, uh, who became the 12 tribes of Israel, uh, were not, wasn't born. Uh, Jacob, of course, is Israel. His name was changed to Israel. So how does this, how does this you know, make sense that it's like this? Well, let me read to you the Revised, Revised Standard Version. Very similar. It says, When the Most High gave to the nations their inheritance, when he separated the sons of men, he fixed the bounds of the peoples according to the number of the sons of God. Look at sons of God, not children of Israel. Where does the where do the uh, translators of the RSV get this phrase from? Well, what happened was the King James translators used the Masoretic text of the Old Testament for their um, source uh, for the Old Testament. And in that text, it says children of Israel in that text. But you have to remember that the oldest manuscript in the Masoretic text that we have dates to about 1000 AD. And they believe that the Masoretic text was created in about the 3rd century AD. This is after Christ. The Revised Standard Version translators didn't use the Masoretic text for their um, Old Testament source. But they, in fact, they used the Septuagint, which is, the, I think I remember telling you that it was the Greek translation of the uh, Old Testament that uh, Ptolemy II um, uh, asked the uh, Jewish uh, people to create so that he could include it in his library at Alexandria. And uh, that the Septuagint used an older text than the Masoretic. The Masoretic wasn't even existing at that time. The Septuagint was, was created in the 2nd century uh, BC. Or well, maybe, I think it was the 2nd century BC, maybe the 3rd. But it was before Christ. And so in that version, the Septuagint, as well as the older Hebrew text that they had, <clears throat> and they have these uh, fragments that they found in the Dead Sea Scrolls as well, it, in those old manuscripts, the phrase is not children of Israel, but sons of God. Isn't that interesting? And you know, what I found interesting was this version of the scriptures. This is a paraphrase phrase, the New Living Translation. The New Living Translation, as well as the Living Translation. If you have the Living Bible, it'll say something like this as well. It says, when the Most High assigned lands to the nations, when He divided up the human race, He established the boundaries of the peoples according to the number of angelic beings. And here you can see that the New uh, Living Translation is either using the RSV as its source document, so it actually paraphrased the sons of God into angelic me beings, or it, it went back to the Septuagint as well as the older Hebrew text that they discovered uh, when they discovered the Dead Sea Scrolls. <clears throat> but um, this, these two translations right here 
are probably the correct ones. And when I say probably, I'm going to say they are the correct ones compared to this one. So the question is, why is this one like this? It's because, as I mentioned before in the, in the previous parts, that the uh, Jewish scholars tended to reject the idea that the um, watchers were angels, that the sons of God that came down to be to procreate with the daughters of men, they they, they rejected the idea that they were angels. They they said that they were the sons of Seth. Uh, Seth is from the godly line, so they called it they called his uh, descendants, the sons of God, and they held to that view. And in fact, the uh, Catholic Church as well kept, kept that view. But if you look at the old text, it doesn't say that. It says sons of God and angelic beings. And even here in the book of Jubilee, it calls them the angels of the Lord, that these are the watchers. So you have here uh, these two translations that reflect that. Now, what does this mean, Deuteronomy 32.8? It means that when God created the nations, He He didn't create you know, as many as He could. He numbered them, and, and I believe the number was is the common number. The traditional number is seventy nations He created. That the reason He stopped at seventy was because the number of the sons of God it wasn't seventy. There were, there were more than seventy, as we're going to see, but they. Um, he, he created the uh, nations so that He could put sons of God over the nations. And so these angelic beings, these watchers, if you if we could use this terminology, would be responsible for the different nations and so that they could instruct the children of men in each of these different nations. So these angels would have uh, authority over their own personal nation and even uh, smaller segments of the nation. And then they would be sitting in judgment and uh, standing for the uprightness of God uh, over these nations. So, so you have these angelic beings, these spiritual beings that are having a, a covering on the different nations. And that comes from Deuteronomy 32.8. Now, <clears throat> let's move on. And we, we see this in action in the book of Daniel. And you're probably familiar with this uh, passage, Daniel 10, 12 to 13. And here, Daniel was praying in chapter 10. And if you look at from the very beginning of the chapter, he started to pray and uh, he wanted to know the, um, the uh, understanding or the, uh, the interpretation of these visions that he was receiving. And so this angel comes to explain it to him. But listen to what the angel says. Then said he unto me, Fear not, Daniel, for from the first day that thou didst set thine heart to understand, and to chasten thyself before thy God. Thy words were heard, and I am come for thy words. So the angel says, from the very first day that you started praying to understand the visions, uh, I started coming, coming to you to give you the uh, uh, interpretation. But then the angel says this, But the prince of the kingdom of Persia withstood me one and twenty days. Okay? So that's twenty-one days, and in fact, so from the very first day, which is uh, 21 days before, which is when Daniel said he began to pray, um, from the very first day the angel started to come to give him the answer, but he was held up by the prince of the kingdom of Persia. Who is this? Is this, is this the uh, human prince? I don't think so, because a, a man cannot withhold a, uh, an angel. And the angels are much stronger and more powerful than we are. Here he's speaking about this person, the watcher or the son of God, sons of God, that are in charge of the nation of Persia. Here are these sons of God that were put in charge of nations. And that's who was holding up this angel from coming to Daniel. But lo, he goes on, Michael, one of the chief princes, came to help me, and I remained there with the kings of Persia. So Michael, so God saw the predicament that this angel he had sent. Uh, to talk to Daniel, and so he sends Michael, who is one of the archangels, one, the uh, among the top tier of angels, to help him, to help him. So he comes, and then more reinforcements for the prince of Persia, the kings of Persia. These are more watchers and more sons of God come out to oppose them. 
And so Michael and this angel are fighting against all of them, and that's why it took them it took him three weeks to finally get to Daniel. I think Michael finally said, "I'll hold him off, you know. <laughs> I'll, I'll play this rear guard action. You take off and give Daniel the message." It's been three weeks now. We were fighting these uh, watchers, and says so. so I, and then I left out the middle part where he gives the uh, interpretation, and then we just jump to the ending part of the passage. It says, "And then said he, Knowest thou wherefore?" I come unto thee, he's asking Daniel, do you know where I'm coming from? And of course the answer is from, from God's, God's throne room itself, from heaven. And now will I return to fight with the prince of Persia, this, this first guy right here. I'm going to go back and I'm going to contend with this uh, fallen angel, if, you, if I could say that, this watcher or one of the sons of God. And when I am gone forth, lo, the prince of Grisha shall come. I mean, there's another one right here. This one, again, a watcher who was over the nation of Greece. He's going to come and oppose him with the prince of Persia. But I will show thee that that which is noted in the scripture of truth, and there is none that holdeth with me in these things, but Michael, your prince. So when God allotted the nations to the different sons of God, he kept just you know these these sons of God are are the fallen angels, and uh, they're not the ones that um uh came into the daughters of men, but they are they they are the ones who are are loyal to Satan, who is the among the top tier of these sons of God but uh these angels right here, as we saw in the second epistle of Peter and Jude, where God had taken them at after the uh, at the time of the flood. And he put them in Tartarus. He chained them and he kept them in prison there. And he's, they're going to still be there until the final judgment where he will cast them into the lake of fire. These sons of God are also fallen, but they didn't fall into their temptation with the daughters of men. But they still had authority over earth, over sinful men. And so these are fallen angels. They're part of uh, Satan's um, his, his group. And Satan, of course, is the head of the fallen angels. And so here, uh, God had given these nations, you know, where he had put these fallen angels over the nations. But over Israel, he put his angel, Michael, over them. Michael was not a fallen angel. He's the archangel. And Michael is over the nation of Israel. So that's what uh, this angel tells Daniel. Okay, so that's... That's the one thing I want us to learn about the uh, Watchers and who they are. And because of the Watchers, uh, as we saw from the book of Enoch, man's wickedness increased. And it was just incredible. Before that, um, it, it wasn't, you know, there was harmony, I, I believe. Uh, but after the uh, Watchers came and the giants were born to them, everything just you know, fell apart. And uh, there's, a, there's a phrase, uh, in Papua New Guinea, in the, in the Melanesian pigeon, where we say any bagarapin, which means it's all, you know, it's all had it. It's just everything is just, you know, broken up and uh, terrible at this point. And so man just goes deeper and deeper into sin. It's just the world was never the same after that. And as I told you before, uh, that man, be, the animals began to eat each other. The giants were eating the animals, and man also became a carn carnivore and and these tigers and lions and bears, as they say, you know, they became carnivores. It wasn't like that originally. All the animals, including man, was a vegetarian. And it's going to return to that, I believe, in the millennium. Because when God and Jesus comes and he sets up his, he's going to build his, his temple. His temple is uh, described in the book of Ezekiel in the latter chapters. But he's going to build his temple and out of the, uh, from under his throne will flow a river. It's going to go both east and west. It's going to flow into the Mediterranean as well as into the um, Jordan Rift Valley, which is where the River Jordan flows, and it's going to flow into the Dead Sea. And it says wherever that water goes, it's the river of life. It's going to just, life is just going to spring forth. And right now there's a Dead Sea where there is nothing can grow there, but when this river comes out from Jesus' throne in the millennium, it's going to flow into the Dead Sea, and uh, from there it's going to overflow into the uh, Gulf of Aqaba, uh, which is the Red Sea. And um, it, it's just going to 
teem with life. And the scripture says there's just going to be so much fish uh, just, you know, swimming around in these lakes and in the streams and in the oceans that we can just, you know, we would be able to um, catch them. And so, so maybe, I guess maybe we can eat fish, but there's also going to be fruit, fruit trees along the river that we're going to be able to eat of. And the leaves of these trees are going to be uh, a healing to the nation. So whenever you get, you, know, you feel sick or, or maybe you fell down and you hurt yourself, you just get one of these leaves and you crush it and you put the ointment on your injury or you, or you eat it and it heals your body. And it's just going to be an amazing time. Uh, so, um, but because of man's wickedness, everything fell apart. And uh, people began to eat the animals and uh, we began to use each other. And instead of loving each other, man began to use each other. There became abuse and uh, people began to fornicate and go after all kinds of sexual sins and it just fell apart. And also during this period there was genetic hybridization because the sons of God had intervened in the normal procreation of mankind. And these two things right here brought about the judgment of God, which was the flood. The reason I mention this is because today we see the same thing. I mean, you know, talk about man's wickedness, especially since the advent of the internet. Uh, it is it is just amazing. I mean, back when I was younger, I mean, there was there wasn't even um, uh, a Playboy magazine wasn't even there at that time, or, or it had just come out shortly after I was born. But it was there. It was tame, you know. I mean, it was shameful to have that kind of thing. But now you can turn on the internet, and young kids, you know, high school kids and junior high and elementary kids can go on the internet, and, and they can see all kinds of things that unthinkable, you know, back in the 50s and even the 60s. And so it's just polluting people's minds. And um, so that the situation is just like in the days of Noah. The man is continually thinking about, um, you know, wicked, wicked things all the time now. Uh, how to you know, get money for themselves, how to swindle people of money. There's greed and there's lust. And as uh, Paul says to Timothy, in the, in the last days, people will be lovers of self. And he goes on an entire list of things. And when I go through that list, I start checking them off and say, you know, that's today. Yeah. And they hold to a form of religion but deny its power. I mean, there's a, there, we, you know, people are going to church, but as the uh, Gallup poll and other posters have found, that even though there are churches proliferate across the land in many countries, that the lifestyle of the Christians are just about the same as the lifestyle of the non-Christians. You know, the, the same thing, you know, motivates both both sides. And uh, as I mentioned in an earlier lesson, one of the big sins in the Christian church is fornication. And uh, we have so many cases in America alone of pastors uh, being caught in fornication, in cases of adultery, in uh, pedophilia. Uh, it is, uh, it, it's right here, this word right here, wickedness describes our time as well. And in terms of genetic hybridization, scientists are discovering now the from the genome and the genetic code how to splice in you know, genes from other species into the human species and even into plants and other animals to create a uh, what they would, what they think is a bigger and better crop. And that's the that's why there's such a great um uh, you know, kind of uproar against GMOs, genetically modified organisms, or food. And so we have this thing right here in our science that is just leaping ahead. And they're discovering now the, perhaps the secret of extending uh, man's life. They've discovered that at the ends of the chromosomes there are these pieces of um, um, pr protein called the telomeres, and these protect the, pr the pr chromosomes from um, deformation or, or being deformed. But as each um, division of the cell, these telomeres start to wear down until finally they, they're gone. And when, they're, when they disappear, the cells cannot function anymore and the people will die and they get old and they die. So these genetic scientists are discovering ways of extending the telomeres so that they can extend the life of people's cells and their bodies, uh, so extending their life on Earth. And so here, 
I think God knows, you know, of course, what's going on, and He's seen the same thing occurring on earth today, even as in the days of Noah. And because of that, we are really in danger of seeing His judgment come, uh, maybe even within my lifetime, and I believe it will be within my lifetime. But uh, let's, let's end this on some good news, because I want to end it with this third application point, and it's this. That God, I believe, this is, uh, I've, I've not heard anybody uh, say this or teach this, but as I've taken us through this passage, I think it, it becomes clear that He has um, recruited a new group of watchers. Okay, a new group of watchers. Are you saying, well, is He creating new of these sons of God in heaven that He's going to send down to earth? Well, you know who they are, these sons of God today? are believers in the New Testament. They're Christians. And I want to show you a verse. And we're going to talk about the sons of God, Christians. We're going to talk about uh, how we are at war with the um, fallen watchers and how we will even judge them. And I'm going to show you a bunch of scriptures right now, so stick with me as we go through these scriptures. Okay? It's nothing that I made up myself, but you can actually see them in scriptures. First of all, the term the sons of God. Who are the new sons of God? Are they angels in heaven? This is what John 1 verse 12 says. But as many as received him, who's him? It's the Logos, the uh, God, God man, Jesus Christ himself, God incarnate. But as many as received him, to them gave, to them gave the power to become the sons of God even to them that believe in His name. Okay. Who are these people? It's the people who receive Jesus Christ and who believe in the name of Jesus Christ. It's the believer. Those are now the people that or the creatures that God calls the sons of God. Prior to that, the sons of God, okay, I don't have the um, thing here, oh, let me go all the way up to the top. Prior to that, the sons of God were the watchers. These, these were these angelic beings that would stand before God and give an account to God. And uh, these are the sons of God in Genesis chapter 6 that uh, were, were tempted by the daughters of men. Okay, but now, who are the sons of God again? <clears throat> the people that receive Jesus and believe in His name. Okay? And uh, this word power, I think I remember I told you that this word power in the English is a translation of at least two Greek words. One is the word dunamis, which means the ability, you know, the, the ability to do something. And that one you find in Acts 1.8. But when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, you shall uh, receive power, dunamis, and you will be my witnesses, both in uh, Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and to the uttermost parts of the world. And that's dunamis. And then power also translates into the from the Greek word exousia, which means uh, authority. So not dunamis, but exousia. But they both have the same English word, power. And you find that one in Matthew 28, verse 18, where Jesus says, All power has been given unto me. And there he's not talking about dunamis, he's talking about exousia. All authority has been given unto me. Now which of those two Greek words, exousia for authority or dunamis for ability, which of those words do you think is the one that's used right here in John 1 verse 12? That's right. You're right. It's the word exousia. To them gave the authority to become the sons of God. And you know, when I remember as a young Christian, this is one of the first verses you ask people to memorize so that they can see that when they receive Christ, they now become sons of God. But I never saw the import of this uh, truth until I looked at this study on Genesis chapter 6 because when God calls us the sons of God and He gives us exousia, authority and now you can see why it is I thought it was simply you know, as a son of God I, I uh, have an inheritance with Him as a son you know. but where does the authority part come in? well it's this thing right here remember? the authority over nations, that God had set these watchers over nations and they had authority to instruct, to judge, 
and to uphold God's right uprightness on the earth. It takes authority to do that. You have to be commissioned to do that. Okay? And so now he has you know, created in his grace a new group of sons of God, and they're the believers, the Christians, you and me. And when you go to church and the believers there, they're the sons of God that God has given this authority to. Isn't that amazing? And here I, I think of them as these great angels, but now when I look in the mirror, I'm looking at a at a, a potential watcher, a pre-watcher, one that is destined to be a watcher. So it is, it is quite uh, humbling to think that God would call me and you and all believers to this station and to this destiny. And then you find it in John 1.12. This phrase, the sons of God, if you trace it through the New Testament, you'll find it in these verses, and they always refer to believers, not angels. Okay? So when you come to the New Testament, now the sons of God are the Christians. But because we are, we are now at war with the fallen watchers. The watchers, the, the uh, fallen angels are still there. and They still have authority on this earth. Even Jesus recognized the authority of um, Satan when he was on earth in John chapter 14 you read the very last verse where he tells his disciples that let's go from here because the prince of this world is coming he recognized Satan as the prince of this world Satan had authority over this world when man sinned he uh, basically he abrogated his authority or he gave up his authority and he gave it to Satan and so Satan now is the prince of this world and not man and so Jesus recognizes that, but there's going to come a time when he will be taken off and his authority will be taken away and he will replace it with the sons of God, which is, which is us. And so, but the, until that time, we are at war with the fallen watchers and they know who we are. You know, it's this common phrase is, I know who you are and I know where you live. And these watchers are quite familiar with us as believers and they oppose us and that's why his name is Satan or Satan, and basically the Hebrew word Satan means adversary or enemy, the one who opposes. And so that's who Satan is, and that's who the, his fallen angels cohorts are. They are Satan to us. They are adversaries on this earth, and they are out to destroy us. And that is why Paul says in Ephesians 6, and Paul knows this truth as well, that we are the uh, future watchers. And so he says, finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Okay? And so here, this power is talking about God's power, not our power. Put on the whole armor of God, and this word whole means every piece of it, that ye may be able to stand, and this word stand means to stand without wavering. I mean, you can stand, but you know when the wind blows, like, whoa, you know, the wind can push us over. But he wants us to stand so strongly in the power of God's might that when Satan comes against us, we don't even waver. I mean, we, don't, we don't even flinch. And so that's what he wants us to do. And how can we do that? Only as we put on the whole armor of God so that we can stand against the wiles or the schemes or the lies or, the, or his, his evil plans or his cunning or his deceit of the devil. That's what we need to stand against. You're going to find, and then the, let me go on to the next phrase. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, or in other words, against people. I mean, let's, let's face it, of course, people can hurt us. They can arrest us. They can put us into prisons. They can torture us. They can kill us. You know? But that's it. That's all they can do. They can just hurt our bodies. But Satan, what he can do is get into our minds and into our hearts. And that's what he tries to do with his with his wiles. But we wrestle not against flesh and blood. Now I want to show you the different kinds of watchers that we have here. But against the principalities. This is the lowest rung of watcher, watchers. These would be equivalent. You know, we, we, we call a principality like the principality of Monaco, you know, which is a small portion, used to be a part of France, but they became independent. Now they're a principality. And so here over the principalities would be equivalent to like a mayor or even up to a governor, you know, the leader of a state or a province, a province, a provincial leader. But those would be the uh, principalities. And then against the powers, 
this this is a higher level of a fallen angel of a watcher this fallen this, this powers would be the ones who watch over an entire nation there might be one or there might be many as we saw in the book of Daniel the kings of Persia and so they have these powers and every nation has these watchers these fallen angels that that are overruling the nation itself okay so we have the principalities which is the lowest rung over your city maybe over your town over your village over your state over your province but then we're also coming against the powers over our entire nation and against the rulers this word rulers has the word it's a compound word and the, the beginning part of the word has the word cosmos in it cosmos is, is not the guy from uh, the Seinfeld uh, Jerry Seinfeld's comedy you know this word cosmos in the Greek means the world so these rulers are the ones that are actually hovering around the entire world they, of course it includes Satan and he has other you know people with him like Beelzebub and other demonic or fallen angels that are very very powerful and they, they're not necessarily restricted to an entire nation like these these angels are but their uh, authority is around the entire world and so they are hovering around the whole world and they keep these guys in line and these guys keep these guys in line okay? and so it says we are against the rulers of the darkness of this world okay? this world this word world is not the same world as cosmos this one has the word cosmos this word here in the Greek is uh, ion and that means of this present age okay? the darkness of this present age and that this age will come to an end when Jesus Christ comes back and he will put an end to this age and all of these principalities powers and rulers are going to be cast into the abyss and uh, they're going to be you know including Satan so that the millennium even though there will be sinners inhabiting the earth at that time there will not be any uh, fallen angels at least you know to or, or de demons even to hinder them and so um, it will be a whole different world at that period, a whole different age. And then finally he says, again, spiritual wickedness in the heavenly places. And so he, now he really defines it. We're talking about spiritual beings, wicked beings in the high places, which is the word for heavenly places as well. So that, that kind of includes everybody against the spiritual wickedness in the heavenly places. That's who we are warring against. And how do they try to defeat us in our hearts and in our minds? If they can de get us to uh, um, doubt the Lord or doubt God as they, they did with Eve and even Adam, if they can get us to doubt His uh, His goodness and His love toward us, if they can get us to doubt His word, His truth to us, then they've got us. And so that's why Paul says in Second Chronic, uh, Second Corinthians chapter ten, he says. We, you know, battle not. We battle against these spiritual forces and uh, with with weapons that are not uh, worldly, but and we take captive every thought to the obedience of Christ, and so that's how they attack us through our thought life and our feelings and our uh, desires and our lusts, and that's why we need to be very well aware of that, and so that we can stand uh, because of what they are trying to do, and so he says. He repeats this to himself. Paul says, Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God. And he's repeating what he already said, that ye may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all, to stand. Okay? So he repeats what he said, which shows that it's very important. Stand, therefore, having your loins girt about with truth. Or in other words, put, the, put on the belt of truth. Because this is where they're going to attack you first of all. Cause you to doubt the truth of God the truth that He exists, and the truth of His Word to us. And unless we are convinced of those truths, that God is real, and that His Word is truth, uh, we're, we're already defeated. But we need to be convinced of that. And then having on the breastplate of righteousness. Another area they will attack us is in our righteousness. They're going to say, you're not, you're not that good of a person, you know. Who are you? You know, look at all the sins you commit, and they're going to start pointing out the sins, as it says that Satan is the is the persecutor, and he's the one that um, you know comes and he he 
he tries to show us that we are not worthy. And so we need to put on the breastplate of righteousness. And God's breastplate, this is not ours, this is God's breastplate of righteousness, is Jesus himself. So strong that Satan is unable to penetrate it. And uh, his, his lies cannot penetrate that. And then he says, and your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. There's another area that Satan and his you know, his horde of uh, fallen angels will attack us. They're going to try to get us to not share our faith with others. They're going to put the fear of man in us. They're going to say, you know, if you, if you start talking about Jesus to others, they're going to think you're stupid. They're going to laugh at you. They're going to make fun of you. They're going to persecute you. And so what Paul is saying is we need to put on our feet the preparation of the gospel of peace to be ready to stand and to share Christ with others and to share with them the gospel of peace, the good news that Jesus brings, which is peace between man and God. And so that, that's on one area, another area they attack us. And then here's the one, he says, and by all taking the shield of faith. It's kind of like the breastplate of righteousness, but here it's covering you know, the, the Satan's attempts to cause us to doubt in God himself. And so what we do with that is we lift up the shield of faith. And when his lies and his, his, his temptations come, we put the shield of faith up and we, it, we parry those attacks. It says here, Wherefore ye shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked, of all of these wicked fallen watchers. We can quench their fiery darts. And take the helmet of salvation. That's another area they will try to attack us. You're not saved. God doesn't want you. Yeah. Look at all of your sins. Yeah. And that's why we need to take the helmet of salvation. The helmet of salvation is the work of Jesus Christ on the cross. He died for all of our sins. I don't care how, how many sins you've committed in the past. You will commit sins in the present. And even sins in the future, all of them have been paid for by Jesus' death and the blood He shed on the cross. It's done. It's finished. And God's, Jesus himself said on the cross, It is finished. Tetelestai. Paid in full. Completely. Even to the very last sin we commit. They're all paid for on the cross. And so that is the only reason we enter into his heaven, into his presence, into his kingdom. Because of that helmet of salvation we have, which is the cross and the sacrifice of Jesus for us. And the sword of the Spirit. One of, this is the our offensive weapons now. We have the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. And so we can pull that out from our belt of truth and we can parry the uh, lies of Satan with our shield of faith and we can thrust into him with the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, which is what Jesus did when he said, It is written. And he would quote scriptures. And when he quoted scriptures, Satan and all of these, these other fallen watchers backs away. Because they cannot refute it. God's word is powerful, sharper than a two-edged sword. And so we need to wield that sword. And the more of the scriptures we know, the more we memorize, the bigger our sword gets. And then finally he says, praying. Praying is another offensive weapon. It's like when the uh, when an army invades and they land the troops on the beachheads. You know, the first thing they do is they, they call their battleships and they just lay down a whole barrage of uh, artillery and I, I see that as praying that we're going to ask God to go before us and to you know defeat our enemies even before we confront them praying always with all prayer and supplication in the spirit so we're not talking about just you know mindless repetitious prayer but in the spirit genuine prayer in spirit and in truth and watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all the saints and here we're going to be watching out for each other. We need to watch each other's back because Satan is really good at getting us to attack each other and getting us to stab each other in the back. Trust me, I know about getting stabbed in the back. When, when, when you're a pastor of a church, you get stabbed in the back a lot. And uh, Satan is really good at getting Christians to criticize and to destroy each other with words. And uh, it's, it's a terrible thing, but here he says we need to watch out for each other with all perseverance and supplication, prayers for all the saints. We need to be looking out and praying for each other. That's Ephesians 6. So that's, that's what's happening in our war against these fallen. And then I want to show you this verse from Daniel. He says we will reign with Christ forever. 
This is from Daniel chapter 7. He says, But the saints of the Most High shall take the kingdom. Isn't that something? The saints of the Most High shall take the kingdom and possess the kingdom forever. And then he says, that's not, that's not God good enough, you know. Not only forever, but even forever and ever. You know, I, I'm not sure how much how much more years that adds to forever, but uh, in other words, forever uh, ad infinitum. I mean, ever and ever and ever and ever and ever. Okay? That's what he's saying here. I beheld and the same horn made war with the saints and prevailed against them. He's talking about the Antichrist. And doesn't that sound like Revelation chapter 13? Revelation comes right out of Daniel. It's the same phrase almost. Until the Ancient of Days came, and judgment was given to whom? To the saints of the Most High. And, that, and the time came that the saints possessed the kingdom. Okay? That's us. We're the saints. That God is going to give judgment over to us. And then we're going to possess His kingdom. And He shall speak great words against the Most High. And shall wear out the saints of the Most High. And to think to change times and laws. Again, right out of Revelation 13. Or Revelation 13 is taking this right out of Daniel, I should say. And they shall be given into His hand until a time and times and the dividing of times. of time. And here, this phrase right here means three and a half years. And again, that's repeated also in Revelation uh, chapter 13, that's, that the Antichrist will have dominion and power over the saints uh, for three and a half years. But the judgment shall, shall sit, and they shall take away his dominion. Who's they? The saints of the Most High. They shall take away his dominion to consume and to destroy it unto the end. And the kingdom and dominion and the greatness of the kingdom under the whole heaven shall be given to the people of the saints of the Most High whose kingdom is an everlasting kingdom, and all dominions shall serve and obey God, Him. Praise God, including us. We will serve and obey Him too. But He has given to us an everlasting kingdom, and we will rule with Him, and we will be in judgment over um, the Antichrist and his, his host. God will put us over Him. And then I want to take us to uh, the Sermon on the Mount. I want to just point out some passages from the sermon, Matthew chapter 5. And these start to make sense when you look at it in terms of who, will, who we will become, the watchers over the uh, nations of, this, of the millennial age and even beyond. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. It's not just that we're going to be in the kingdom of heaven, but we will possess the kingdom of heaven because we will be reigning in the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are, the, are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. Well, we're, we might be mourning now, but we will be comforted because God is going to give His kingdom to us. And that will comfort us. Blessed are the meek. And this phrase right here is a common one. For they shall inherit the earth. You know, you, you, have you ever wondered, you know, what exactly did this thing mean? It sounds good. What does it mean? And now, when you understand that we will one day be the watchers over this, this earth with Jesus Christ as the, the king over all, now you understand this, that we're going to inherit the earth. We really genuinely will inherit the earth. We will be given authority over the earth. Blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. I mean, can you imagine? You're going to be part of, a, of an administration, not... Not of parties, not of labor parties or anything like that, but we will be part of an administration that will last forever. It's the party of God. That's it. There's only one candidate. There's no voting and no, no voting allowed. God will be king and Jesus will sit on the, his throne. And finally, if you, if you want uh, righteousness, if you want justice, you will finally be satisfied and fulfilled uh, because at that point, uh, everything will be right, finally. In Hawaiian we say pono. Pono means right and just and fair. And that's what's going to take place when the king sits on his throne. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. And we, when we are watchers, we need to be merciful in our judgments. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. And that's another thing that we need to remember when we become the watchers, to be pure in heart, lest we uh, be tempted. I'm not sure we can be tempted. You know, we will not have the sin nature. 
but I know those those angels fell, and so I hope we will not be able to fall. And I, I understand the, uh, the the theology of uh, grace that God will keep us from those uh, from that becoming an uh, uh, eventuality. Uh, but we will see God as as we have a pure heart. And then finally, it says, "Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God." This word "children" in the Greek is the, is the word "huios." which means actually sons of God. Blessed are the peacemakers, those who bring peace between um, man and woman, or men, woman and woman, and man and man, we will be in judgment. And as we saw in the earlier uh, passage from the book of Jubilees, that the watchers were supposed to uh, be like judges in, in, uh, when there was conflict uh, among men. Well, we, that's what we're going to be. We're going to be the peacemakers. For they shall be called the sons of God. And as God's sons, we will be the watchers, and we will be the peacemakers on this earth. And then you come to the Great Commission. And when, now this Great Commission makes more sense now when you understand who we will become. And Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All exousia, all authority, all power is given unto me in heaven and on earth. Go ye therefore and teach all nations. The word teach makes means to make them my disciples. Now, you know, I've been involved in a ministry where this was our model, to make disciples of all nations. And, you know, I, I, I never really understood this part because, you know, how do you make an entire nation uh, God's disciple? Uh, look at the nations of the world. How many nations right now follow God? You know, very, very few. I mean, people would say, well, America follows God. Mm, I, I don't know about that anymore. Maybe at one time it did. But now we have fallen far away from God, if anything. <clears throat> but we are supposed to disciple all nations, make them followers of God. And when will that really take place? It will be fulfilled when we, when we become the watchers over the nations. And it's going to be our job, our responsibility. In Hawaiian, we have the word kuleana. And that means to, the responsibility, you know, our, 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 our work, our job to make sure the nations, the, pe the people that are under us, are going to be following after God. Baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. So you're saying, what, what are we going to take, teach the nations? You're going to be teaching them what Jesus teaches us and commands us to do. Jesus will, will be on his throne. We're going to be seeing him and learning from him. And as he gives us orders, we take them to the nations. And it's going to be our jobs as the sons of God, as the watchers of the millennium and beyond, to make sure that they also obey God. And lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. Again, this word world in the Greek is not the word cosmos, the end of this world, but it's the end of the age, or even you could say the end of forever, because ion could be forever. So even until the end of forever, Jesus is going to be with us, and definitely through the millennium, and even into the eternal state, he will be with us. Amen. So you can see how this really makes sense. Now, what I want to show you, just briefly, is right here. Go back to this uh, passage where I talked about principalities, powers, and rulers. I showed you that these are in increasing orders of responsibility and authority. Okay? And uh, when, when we come and we stand at the Bema Seat of Christ, Christ is going to judge us for the works we've done in, this, in our bodies, both good and bad. And what, the reason He's going to judge us is He's going to see where to place us, whether we are able to be uh, you know, in charge of a principality, or in charge of a larger area, or in, ch in charge of a much larger area. And so depending upon how faithful we are in our life now, He's going to award us and reward us with authority in the, in the kingdom to come. And I, I know that if you love the Lord, you will want to do the most for the Lord, especially for eternity. And so your work here in this life will not go unrewarded. But where you fall in terms of these categories will determine, uh, will be determined by how you live today and how, how much of your life you're living faithfully and obediently to God even in this life. I, I, I hope everybody can at least jump into this area. Maybe there's, there are things even 
uh, lower than this, perhaps, uh, for Christians who are just not walking with God now. I'm not sure. But uh, it, it behooves us right now to learn how to obey God because only as we know how to trust Him and obey Him will we become uh, really, um, you know, uh, how, how should I say, um, our abilities to rule others will depend upon our uh, ability to submit ourselves to God, basically is what I'm trying to say. That's why Jesus says in His kingdom, if you want to you know, be a ruler in His kingdom, you need to become the servant of all. So in this life, we need to learn to serve and to give ourselves to others because that's the best training to become a ruler in His kingdom by becoming a servant. Because rulers in His kingdom are servants of people. They're not people who lord it over others. They're people who serve others. Okay, now let's get back and let's close the study out. And talking about ruling, this is going to be our destiny. From 1 Corinthians 6, and you've heard these verses, but now you can listen to them in a different light. Dare any of you, having a matter against another, go to the law, to law before the unjust? In other words, if you have a problem with a brother or sister in Christ, why do you go to the unbeliever to judge between you? And not before the saints. That's what, that's what Paul is saying. Do ye not know that the saints shall judge the world? And see, Paul is reflecting again what Daniel said in chapter 7 of his prophecy. Do you not know that the saints shall judge the world? Why? Well, because we will become watchers in the kingdom to come. And if we, we're going to be able to judge the world at that time, we should be able to learn to judge right now in the disputes of man. And if the world shall be judged by you, are ye unworthy to judge the smallest matters? Okay, so we're at school right now. God is training us to, to be the judges of the future and His kingdom by allowing us to judge between small matters today. And he goes on, he says, Know ye not that ye shall judge angels. Who are these angels? It's the fallen angels. It's the ones that are in Tartarus right now even, and the ones who are the, the watchers, the fallen angels who are disrupting this world and keeping people from Christ. And we're going to sit in judgment over them. How much more things that pertain to this life. So Paul is, is reinforcing that idea. And then finally, in the book of Revelation 20, verse 4, John writes, And I saw thrones, and they sat upon them, and judgment was given unto them. And this is a reflection of Daniel chapter 7. Who are they? The saints of the Most High. And I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus and for the word of God, and which had not worshipped the beast, neither his image, neither had received his mark upon their foreheads or in their hands. And they lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years. And this is the millennial reign. And you can see right here that we're going to reign with him because we're going to be serving him as watchers over this world. That Jesus will be setting up his throne in Jerusalem in the temple that he will build uh, there. And he will send us out throughout the world to watch over mankind and watching over villages and towns and cities and uh, principalities and uh, states and provinces and nations and in, in the entire world. And again, the way we will be allotted this authority is by how we do on this earth. But we will reign with Christ a thousand years. Well, let's, let's get back here. Knowing that, knowing our destiny, how should we then live today? I'm taking a phrase from Francis Schaeffer. How should we then live? We should live circumspectly, seriously about our Christian faith. I, I know, you know, there's a real temptation to to enjoy our life, you know, to live even as uh, people of the world live. But we should really discipline ourselves now and to learn how to walk with God, how to listen to God, how to pray to Him, and to to listen to His Word from His Word and through through His Spirit within us. That, we, that in the kingdom to come, it will become a habit. It will be part of our life. And uh, we can show God that we are faithful servants of His. That's what we want to show Him in this life, that we are faithful servants of His, so that when He does come, we will hear Him say, Well done, good and faithful servant. Enter into thy rest. 
and he will re reward us with authority so that we can continue to serve him faithfully in his kingdom as watchers and as his the sons of God. Amen? Amen. And I'm going to close. I know I, I know I took a very long time, and I hope you stayed with me through this very end. But you can see how important now Genesis chapter 6 is in its final conclusion of where we will be in eternity. So with that, I say God bless you. Aloha uh, no and maalama pono. You take care. Ahoy ho until we see each other again in the next lesson. God bless. You take care.